Good evening, my name is Paul Charnier. I'm the editorial page editor at the Day newspaper. Uh, we welcome you tonight uh, from Old Saybrook High School for the 33rd District Senate debate. Uh, the participants in tonight's debate are the Democratic candidate, Norm Needleman, and the Republican candidate, State Representative Melissa Zabrin. Uh, I wanted to thank, uh, before we begin, the uh, Superintendent uh, of Schools here at the Old Saybrook, uh, Jan Peruccio. I hope I didn't mess that up. Also, uh, special thanks to the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut, which has been a co-sponsor for our debates. This is the fourth uh, state senate debate we've held here in Southeastern Connecticut. Also, I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut, who are once again providing timekeepers for tonight's uh, debate. I'll briefly go over the rules. Uh, we're going to begin the debate with uh, one-minute opening statements uh, that were determined uh, by a flip of the coin. Uh, then we'll go to questions. Uh, each candidate with 90 seconds on each question. Uh, the first candidate gets a minute to uh, answer the question. The opponent gets 90 seconds to respond and rebut, and then back to the original uh, candidate for 30 seconds. Uh, with that, I believe we're ready to go. And um, uh, again, by the flip of the coin, the first opening statement for one minute uh, goes to Mr. Needleman. Good evening, and thank you all. Tonight, you will hear from both candidates about the challenges that revolve around the state's financial health. We will both agree that discipline and common sense need to be brought into the budget process. We will also agree that major challenges would have to be confronted and that tough funding decisions will have to be made. But the disparity in our perspectives will also become clear. Only one of us will display a knowledge of strategic planning, economic development, and job creation. What you hear tonight will inform the choice you make in 12 days. I will make it clear that budget cutting, I'll make it clear that budget cuts are vital, but they are only half the battle. Budget cutting is not a growth strategy. Job creation and economic development are the engines that will drive our state's economic recovery. By the end of this debate, I hope that I will have convinced you that I have the experience, track record, skills, and ideas that best represent our district and the State Senate. Thank you. Representative Jabrin. Thank you very much. I'm Melissa Jabrin. It's been my privilege to represent Colchester, East Haddam, East Hampton for the last six years in the House Chamber. I'm a moderate Republican who is fiscally conservative and socially liberal. This means when the knives come out, I get it from both sides. Fun, right? Not really, but I know trading barbs is something that comes with the job, but tonight I'm here as much to listen as to talk. During the last two years as a minority party, our input into the budget process was instrumental. For the first time, a true bipartisan budget was formulated. If not for the participation of the minority, meeting Republican intervention, today we would not have a constitutional spending cap, $1 billion in the rainy day fund, nor any check on Democrat tax increase proposals. What made this possible? Equal party representation in your Senate. Your Senate seat is crucial to this balance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we begin the debate. First question goes to Mr. Needleman. Uh, Mr. Needleman, you are investing an enormous amount of money into this election, uh, nearly $400,000 according to the last campaign filing, um, uh, 460000 in total, 400000 of it your own. Um, how do you respond to criticism that you're trying to buy the election? Um, thank you for that, and I'm glad you led with that question. Um, I'm someone who believes that we have a very flawed electoral system. I believe that we are coming to a point where we have too much money, um, and most of it is dark. We know that there's $1,150,000 coming into four Senate races in order to try to flip this state Senate to Republican. I knew that the last time I ran, because the last time I ran, in the last two weeks of the campaign, $50,000 worth of dark money came into the campaign against me when I ran against Art. I'm sorry that I had to do this, 
but I need it to protect myself. This is not a good financial investment for me. I believe that I can solve the problems of the state. I need to be part of the solution, and I am willing to put my money up front where my mouth is to try to be part of the solution. Um, Representative, you have 90 seconds to respond. Thank you. So I am abiding by the citizens' election program and uh, fully. My campaign, unlike my opponent, has never been fined or taken to task for abusing that system like my opponent did in the last election. And unlike my opponent, I spend all of my money in the state of Connecticut. When I reviewed my opponent's filing this morning, I noticed thousands and thousands of dollars paid to Washington, D.C. consultants. That was your choice to do that. I choose to spend my money locally and with our local businesses because they can provide great services for us, and I'm very proud of my positive campaign. Thank Mr. you. Newman, I, want to, I want to clear the air about the last, am I too close? I, mean, I want to clear the air about the last campaign finance violation or the campaign violation. In the debate here or in O-Line against Art, we used, we discussed Donald Trump, and then we used Donald Trump's name in the campaign. Citizens' election had an issue with that. We ultimately, after two years, they said, we're willing to let it go if you say you'll never do it again. We did not think we violated any rules because Donald Trump was not in that election, but we just wanted it to go away. So we signed the papers, but there was no other violation that has been. Thank Thank you. Yeah, I know it's tough to see uh, that they'll yeah. be holding up 15-second warnings and uh, stop signs. I have to watch. Uh, I have and, to watch and, and I'm going to follow up on that. The, the uh, next question begins with uh, Rep Representative Zebrin. Um, given what we've experienced in this campaign and recent campaigns, should Connecticut continue with the Citizens' Election Program that provides public financing for state campaigns? Um, if so, would you suggest any changes when you get the first crack at that? So certainly, as a legislator for the last six years, trying to prioritize taxpayer dollars, I haven't prioritized bumper stickers and mailings paid by taxpayers during the budget price process, and I have looked to eliminate this program. But I've also done some other things, like taking away the opportunity for unopposed grants. For whatever reason, that cannot get over the finish line. We give taxpayer dollars, $11,000, to candidates who don't face an opponent. Another bill I put in was to mandate 75% of all spending in a campaign in Connecticut businesses. If we're using taxpayer dollars, we should keep that money in Connecticut. Those are some of the changes I would look to make. And also uh, maybe max the contribution at the $100 limit so that everyone has a fair chance and they're not reliant on very wealthy friends and family to pay their way. And Mr. Needleman. Thank you. So while some of those suggestions may be interesting and nipping around the edges, um, I think that citizens' election as we have it now is quite flawed. I think that Citizens United, um, state elections is flawed. Citizens United really changed the game. Um, I'm deeply concerned about what that means for Connecticut Citizens Election Program and for all of our national races. Um, I, am, I, I think that the, the program should continue, but I think that because of the dark money aspect of this, we need to remove the limits on people who are attacked by money that comes in from unidentified people. This is, again, I gotta say it, $1,150,000 so far against four Senate candidates. I'm lucky. I mean, when people ask me if I'm buying a race, what am I buying? I'm buying two years' worth of hard labor up in Hartford um, to try to fix the problem in this state for my kids and my grandkids. There's nothing to buy here, but I think I can help. I want to be part of it, but this system is flawed. It needs to be changed. It needs to be updated based on the current federal laws, because that's really where the problem lies. Uh, Representative Jebrin, you get another 30 seconds to respond to what you heard. 
So, so my only response would be, again, in these fiscally uh, challenging times, we're facing a $4.5 billion budget deficit in the next fiscal year. How can we continue to prioritize taxpayer money on campaigns? I have a fundamental problem with that when we're cutting things like Alzheimer's respite care and looking at increasing bus fares. Everything is on the table, I think, and I. For me, I would rather see us make some uh, amendments and changes if we can't eliminate it altogether. But I think having a $100 cap is something that has been, I think, very, um, uh, has been embraced by many folks. Thank you. Um, uh, next question uh, begins with Mr. Needleman. Uh, the state faces a projected $2 billion deficit for the coming fiscal year. Uh, that's the first thing the next government and the legislature must address. Um, and if not addressed, the gap only grows in subsequent years. So what should be the legislature's approach? I think the legislative approach is going to have to be to find ways to economize. This is going to take um, the governor, whichever governor is elected, um, to find ways to streamline the state government. We can save some money. Um, I don't think that you're going to save $2 billion. Um, I think that we're going to need to address the pensions long term, probably by dealing with some of the amortization schedules on them, and of course the discount rates, although they have brought it down to below 7 percent now. Um, so I think we're going to have to find ways to save money, and of course it's obvious that we're going to need to find revenue. Last time there were tax increases and revenue increases of a billion dollars to help close it. Um, Dan Malloy went and got $750 million in givebacks from unions, but they're in the out years, really. Um, I think that we're going to have to find ways to compromise. I think we're going to have to find ways to save money and to raise revenue. And then I think that we're going to have to make big investments in economic development. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Zebrin, you get 90 seconds to respond to what you heard. Thank you. So I certainly hope that I have the opportunity to go to the State Senate and continue the work that I have put in, uh, frankly, tirelessly, seven days a week working on the budget as the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee. I'm willing to work with any problem solver from any party to try and find common sense solutions to deal with this fiscal crisis. And I think we have to start by some low hanging fruit. And that means legislators have to be willing to give up some things as well. One of the things I've given up for six years, I've never sent one taxpayer funded mail called franking mail at the end of session. Just simply doing that is $2 million. My point, there's still some low hanging fruit that we can go after in the budget. I think we have an obligation to do so before we even consider any revenue. We need to make sure we've exhausted every opportunity we can for those efficiencies and cost savings within our budget. That might mean we need to be planning on privatizing some services, whether it's DMV or other social sa safety net services. But the factor, of course, with that is we have a no layoff provision because of CBAC until 2021. Unlike what we should have done, and that is work on our budget immediately, instead we ratified a, con a union contract months, and I mean months, before our budget was even settled. I flew back from vacation just so I could vote no. I have a 100% voting record in the legislature. I take my job very seriously, and I look forward to getting back to work. Uh, Mr. Needleman, you got another 30 seconds on this exchange? Yeah. I, um, I think that the process going forward has got to be an understanding for everybody of shared sacrifice. This is going to take everybody at the table recognizing that there are sacrifices that have to be made, there are decisions that have to be made that are going to cause pain, um, and we need to make sure that that pain is shared fairly and not by those that are most that are in most need of the services that the state provides. Um, I, I just want to continue with that question. We'll begin with. Uh, uh, Representative Zebrin, uh, on this next point, just to drill down a little bit. I mean, it's a big, it's a big amount of money, and, and so you have to kind of look at some big items. Um, and I just want to get the candidates' reactions. Some of these are talked about. Use the rainy day fund; it's 1.2 billion dollars, and potentially growing. Um, are, should tax increases be on the table? Uh, should um, should you look at having to postpone maybe some of the, the pension payments as one of the candidates for governor suggested? Just 
some of the ideas, I'd like to get your reactions to what, what's being talked about with the Sh representative. Sure. So the only thing that the rainy day funds should be looked at tapping for is to pay down our unfunded pension liability, not for new programs, not for continued operating costs. If we're going to be looking at the rainy day fund, we need to make a significant dent in our unfunded pension liability, and that would probably be the only thing that I would be willing to look at and support. It is an all-hands-on-deck uh, reality. I've been the only Republican that would support a new revenue potential, which is the legal legalization of marijuana for those 21 or older. I haven't shut my eyes to the idea of no new revenue. What I've really been hesitant to do, unless it's at all costs, is looking at tax increases. It's something I don't ever want to uh, have to be the first option. When I hear the word shared sacrifice, I think of Governor Malloy, and I think of the two highest tax increases within the, fa the five top 10, because I know Keith Fanoff had an issue with that characterization, but that's the reality. We've had the two highest tax increases ever in the last eight years, and that is not my first option, and I won't be talking about those kinds of shared sacrifices. Right. Thank you. Mr. Needleman. Can you repeat the I'm question? Sorry. Yeah, I, I just your reaction to some of the specific ideas, we, the, the big ticket items we've heard put out there. Should, uh, should the legislature cons consider tapping the rainy day fund, $1.2 billion and, and is growing right now? Uh, should tax increases be on the table? Uh, should it be looked at one of the gubernatorial candidates suggested delaying payments into the, the, the pension system to try to get over this uh, $2 billion hole the state face? I wanted to get your reaction to those. I think part of the reason we got into the mess that we're in is because we delayed payments to the pension funds that would not be high on my list. Although, I think we would need to be discussing um, with the treasurer who has weighed in on this and made some decisions, um, but looking at the amortization schedule on some of the pensions probably would help. Um, they're long-term obligations. They should be treated that way. Um, I believe that the rainy day fund is going to be higher than $1.2 billion. And, um, I would never mandate that something happens to the rainy day fund by legislation, but I do believe that if it gets over a certain threshold, some of it could be used to pay down some of those long-term obligations. Um, when you talk about revenue, I don't think that we need or should address the state's income tax. I think it's a problem. Um, but I do think that the income tax needs to be made more fair. I think we need to incentivize people who are middle income and lower income people to stay here, especially when they retire or when they're young. And as a, I saw that this time. Oh, <laughs> you get another 30 seconds, uh, Representative. Um, again, I, you know, it was, I just go back to 2017. I'm very proud of the work that my caucus put on the table, which was a, bet, a budget on time in the Appropriations Committee delivered in April. Our friends on the other side of the aisle didn't do that until August, August, and they're in the majority. They have the votes, and they weren't able to put together that package on time. I know I have the ability to work across the aisle. I have offices right now next to those folks, and I'm happy to get back to work with them. I'm a tough negotiator. I stand up for taxpayers, and that's what I hope to continue to do. Thank you. Um, uh Ms. Lieneman, uh, uh, what do you say to a voter who might like you uh, personally but fears electing you could put the Democrats back in firm control of the Senate, which is now evenly split, and they don't like the prospects of that? How do you address that? Well, I'm not your average Democrat, and I'm not your average public servant. I've been a first selectman for a long time, and I've worked with anybody who wants to work with me. Um, but I understand that Hartford operates differently and you're in a caucus room. Um, I do know that my, my strength is working not only within my own caucus, but with people across the aisle, not after a budget is submitted, but to begin with, because I think that that's what's going to take. Um, I'm, I'm a fiscally conservative person. Essex has one of the lowest tax rates in the state, and we've kept it that way in the um, almost eight years I've been in office, um, we work on it together. There are no, we, we've passed five budgets that are bipartisan and unanimous, and I'm really proud of that. Thank you. Representative Zebrin? Uh, thank you. So let me describe what the budget process really is. 
It is a, a ton of meetings, and I mean sometimes back to back to back, starting in January all the way through March. I'm one of the only legislators that attends every single subcommittee meeting, even though I'm not technically supposed to. Why? Because my mantra is trust but verify and follow the money. I want to understand why we have to spend X amount in human services versus X amount in the hospital subcommittee. And then I take it a step further. I go and visit prisons across the state. I visited 12 prisons to understand why we had a no-bid contract to deliver inmate medical services held by UConn. A $100 million contract never went out to bid before. And it was only because I did that digging that I feel that I am the best qualified to walk in on day one and deal with those issues, and certainly it is in a bipartisan way. Mr. Needleman, you get 30 more seconds if you'd like on this exchange. No. Okay. okay. Uh, the next question um, uh, goes to uh, Representative uh, Zebrin. Um, you voted against a state law that banned bump stocks, uh, devices intended to turn a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon. Why would you vote against a law like that? Well, I really do appreciate that question. And as I've said for a long time now, I am going to continue to stand up for legal, law-abiding gun owners. Something I've carried with me because this conversation comes up is a list of all the gun laws that we have in the state of Connecticut and the ratio of how they're enforced. And you should know, we have gun laws that are not being enforced on our books. So for instance, one of the laws bans altering a firearm identification mark. In 2017, only 40% of those were actually prosecuted, the rest were nollied. Violating loaded firearm safe storage requirements for minors, that's a critical law. We should be abiding by that all the time. Every single person who is charged with that offense and crime, 100% of them were nollied, thrown out. We didn't prosecute them. Illegally transferring an assault weapon, we only prosecuted 30% of the people that were arrested for that crime. I believe we have very strict gun laws on the books, and I believe we have a problem enforcing them, and I'm gonna continue to listen, and I very much listen intently, but I do stand up for the Second Amendment, and I'm happy to stand by law-abiding gun, gun owners in my district, and that's not a partisan issue. We have Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Green Party members, all exercising their Second Amendment rights. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Needleman, the, the question was on the bump stock law. Wow, I, I'm a gun owner. I've had a gun for a long time. I have more than one. I've, I legally own guns, um, and what I just heard um, was my opponent saying that because we don't enforce some of the laws that are on the books properly, we should throw them all out. I think that that's ridiculous. Um, I'm pretty sure I didn't my, say that. My, my, my opinion is that in a lot of situations, my opponent will use the excuse of let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and that bothers me. Um, I think that Connecticut does have good gun laws on the books, some that may have gone a little bit too far, some that probably don't go far enough. Um, I believe that we work really hard, and the gun laws that have been put on the books in Connecticut have kept people safer. The data really shows that. And I, I just, Melissa's gone to great pains to explain how um, important it is to protect the rights of gun owners. I'm wondering, about those little kids and the people who get shot. Um, we need to make sure that guns are in the hands of people that should have them and that they're used properly and safely. And I, I think that her argument is maybe we should do a little more enforcement, not necessarily that many more laws, but the bump stock ban, even though they haven't been used in Connecticut after what happened in Las Vegas, I would have absolutely supported that. Uh, Reverend Jebrin, you want to clarify your point? You have another 30 seconds. Thank you. I'm just appalled anyone would ever suggest that any rational, normal human being would like to see uh, more children in harm's way. I'm offended by that sort of a comment. The reality is the people who have committed and perpetrated these crimes are sick individuals. They are lawbreakers, they are criminals, and they should absolutely be prosecuted. 
and I will continue to stand up and talk about those things, but I'm not going to throw around accusations just because my opponent doesn't support the Second Amendment and claim that he doesn't support the Constitution. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Ms. Please, if the audience could, yeah, uh, no comments, uh, reactions. <laughs> let, let, let the candidates debate and uh, hold uh, our applause <laughs> at, to the end. Um, Mr. Needleman, uh, you get to begin the next question. Uh, Republicans contend that too much taxation, uh, too much fiscal uncertainty, and too much regulation and red tape uh, make things difficult for businesses in Connecticut. Uh, as a businessman, do you think they have a point? Uh, so um, I have never personally made a decision in my business, and I've been in business for almost 40 years, that was dependent on how much taxes I was going to pay. Um, I, I every, like everybody else, I love to pay less taxes, but like some people, I believe that we have an obligation to make sure that we have a pro, an appropriate social safety net, that we fund the things that we're supposed to fund. My, my life, and I pay a lot in taxes, doesn't live and die on taxation. That said, when it comes to taxation, because I am a first selectman and a business owner, your money is as important as my money. And I want to be clear that if there's tax money there, it's not my money. It's all of our money, and it needs to be spent wisely and appropriately. As far as regulation, I have a laundry list of unfunded mandates and issues with some of the state regulations that I think go too far, and then there are some areas where I think they could do a little bit better. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative. Thank you. So one of the provisions of the bipartisan budget was something that was negotiated because of this concern uh, from the minority, which was the problem, especially within DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So one of the things that was put into the budget was a mandatory 90-day turnaround time for permits because we're finding more and more that our business community is being stalled and stalled and stalled in order to start a project. And as if you know, if you're in the business community, you know, opportunities come up all the time. And I think sometimes we've lost opportunities while people have been waiting around to get a permit or worse, they may have to address the problem themselves without getting the actual permit. And in one case, just recently, about, well, not too recently, about two months ago, I was visiting an oyster farmer in the Clinton area, and he was showing me his electrical outlet, which was right at the dock, asked Deep to, to issue that permit so he could fix his electrical outlet, which is so important to his business, and it was still overhanging the salt water two months later. How long is a business owner going to wait before he fixes those issues himself for the safety and for the uh, expediency of our business community? We need to have common sense turnaround times for our permits, and I think that that was a provision that was rightly inserted in the budget. Um, Thank you. you got another 30 seconds. So, of course, we want DEP and every other agency in the state to turn around quickly. Um, but some things cannot turn around quickly, and a lot of the regulatory overlay in the state of Connecticut comes from the federal government. Um, when it comes to clean water standards and uh, building certain bridges that come through tax dollars, it takes what it takes because of the feds, not because of the state. Um, I am uh, I'm, I'm never comfortable with mandating um, change that says 90 days. And I have to say one other thing. There is this piece of the, the state budget crisis that's killing all the Indians off. I, I and have, there's, okay. I'm sorry, just uh, yeah. uh, to be fair. Um, uh, just following up, and, and uh, Reverend uh, Jebrin, you can begin this exchange. Um, we, we hear this often that, uh, um, that the red tape the businesses face, uh, the legislature passes the laws, but then they it's left to the executive and the departments to carry out those laws, but we, uh, in a lot of these debates, we've heard concerns uh, how they're being carried out. Uh, so is there anything you could do as a senator uh, to try to improve that situation that we, we frequently hear complaints about, the, how those services are carried out? 
Yeah, so one of the things, that when, when you're a legislator, whether you're in the House or the Senate, there's liaisons for each of these agencies, and you work very closely with them, especially when you're dealing with your constituency, because one of the things that we have yet to talk about in the role of a legislator is actually addressing constituent concerns, and sometimes within agencies, those liaisons are very critical. I think it would be important, it's a mandatory review of agency submittals. So what's happening right now is that the governor's staff, the commissioners are putting together their budget proposals for a new administration after January. And only two years ago, I went in and started pulling OPM's recommendations for the budget way before the legislative process, and I made sure that my caucus had a copy of every single agency's regulation proposal changes. I'd like to see us work more closely with the agencies before the session starts. They should be working to say, hey, this is what we're thinking about, changing these regulations or this statute. What do you think about that? And that could help us make sure that we don't have unintended consequences, which do creep up. For instance, in a cottage food law that I was able to get passed in October, um, they were supposed to carve out maple syrup producers and honey producers, and that didn't happen. We're going to have to address that in the new session, and I look forward to taking that cause on because, again, these are the things we should be doing as legislators. It's that constituent service and getting and fixing problems immediately um, is something I'm very prideful about, and I think if we were working with agencies before the session began to at least understand what their priorities are, it would be much better. And, and uh, Mr. Needleman, you get 90 seconds. Can you, can you, uh, uh, during the uh, discussion of the last question, uh, uh, the issue was raised that, and, and I think you commented on it, that uh, regulations are, are often not carried out in an efficient manner, uh, that because the manner in which some of the departments uh, carry out those regulations, uh, a lot of red tape, unnecessary delays and such. So you, you pass the law, is that your job? But what might you do as a senator, uh, if elected, to try to improve the delivery of those services? So again, I, I deal with that now. I always said I dealt with it on two fronts, the business front and the town front. Now I deal with it on the citizen's election front, which is another one where people were well-intentioned when they passed those regulations and the bureaucracy got a hold of them and they became something that a lot of the people who voted for them never expected. There is some element of that. But in, in my years of dealing with the state um, as a user and as a person who interfaces with different departments, whether it's the DOT or the DEP or the Department of Health, we deal with these people all the time. They generally do their best to try to work with people. Doesn't mean that there aren't certain regulations that I think go too far, but um, I'm not sure how you fix that other than being on them all the time and making sure that just because the legislator pa legislature passes something, they don't turn their back on it after that. They have an obligation, just like the governor's office, to watch what's going on and to make sure that the spirit of that law is what they're following and not go too far with it because there are true believers in some of our agencies that will carry the ball a little further. One of the most... Um, Recent, recent ones is the Municipal Stormwater Ordinance, which the legislature did not choose to enhance, but the bureaucracy chose to enhance it on their own because it complies with the federal stormwater management laws. I think it went too far, and it puts an undue burden on us. Thank you. You get another 30 seconds if you'd uh, like on that exchange. Sure, thank you. So again, I was mentioning being very proactive and working with the agencies right away, I think it's critically important. And to Norm's uh, point, you know, I think staying on agencies is critical, but that requires uh, a healthy working relationship. That means you're setting the standard and, and making sure that it's followed right from the beginning. But you can't beat these people up all the time. You're not going to, you know, my grandmother used to say you attract bees with honey, not vinegar. And I think when you work with these agencies, you have to understand, too, the things that they're facing. For instance, I have a lot of lakes in my community, and they would like to be able to treat their lakes in a variety of different ways, but there's only one person who handles that permit at deep. It used to be a one-year permit. We pushed to make it a three-year permit, and that's a way we can still get the job done but now they have a three-year review process, and it's those kinds of common sense things that I'll continue to push as I'm hoping to be your next state senator. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lehman, next question. 
uh, should Connecticut phase in a $15 minimum wage? <clears throat> so I believe in the minimum wage. Um, I don't think that there's a Republican that I know recently at a, at a broad level that believes we should ever do anything with the minimum wage. There's always a million reasons to not do something with the minimum wage. I believe that American businesses are smart enough and capable enough to deal over time with an adjustment in the minimum wage that doesn't make it a great wage, but at least it provides a base level wage that maybe will take some of the burden off of the state and the federal government that provides services for people continually because they work two jobs for nine, 10, 11 dollars an hour. Half the states in the country don't, haven't raised the minimum wage in a while. At least we've done more with that. But I don't think it was because the Republicans wanted it. I think it was because this is a key issue for Democrats. We believe that there should be a minimum wage. What I hear now from, from the other side is we don't, we, you know, it's always an excuse. Never a reason to raise the minimum wage. It's because of this, it's because. They just don't want to raise the minimum wage. I actually think they don't even want a minimum wage. All right. Um, I, I was going to ask a yes or no, and then uh, <laughs> for, for uh, Mr. Needleman. So I, clearly you defend the minimum wage. Were you for the $15 minimum wage? I think as long as it's phased in over the right amount of time, yes. OK. Um, you have 90 seconds to respond, uh, Representative Zebrin. Thank you. So part of being a legislature means, a uh, legislator is when you go to the Capitol and you attend public hearings and you hear uh, the unintended consequences, most likely. And what I heard through the last six years that I've been at the Capitol was business community after business community talking about the issues that would happen with raising the minimum wage in, a, in the way that you're describing. So let me give you an example. I have a frozen yogurt uh, small business in my uh, one of my uh, towns that I represent in East Hampton. She wants to employ after-school kids but can't afford to do so. Even at 10-10, she was getting Getting very concerned. So I went and met with her and we were talking about it and she said, why can't we have a learning wage? That way I can hire more kids. We have a high unemployment rate for our teenagers and I can hire more kids to give them that learning or training wage. I put that bill into the legislature. She came up and testified on it and you would have thought I was asking to, you know, uh, give somebody a dollar an hour. We have many businesses that would like to provide these opportunities, but they can't afford to do it at that sort of a rate, especially in our restaurant business community. Um, at a previous debate, my opponent mentioned that all restaurants pay, you know, don't have to pay the minimum wage. Well, that's not true. The front of the house has the tip credit, but not the back of the house. And when you have a sous chef that's making $16 an hour and a dishwasher's getting hired for 15, what do you think is gonna happen? That sous chef is gonna want more money too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Needleman, you got another 30 seconds to respond to what you heard? Not sure if I heard an answer there, but I'm gonna let that go as a no. Um, again, you can always find a reason and an example of why not to do that, but let's take that sous chef. What is that sous chef gonna do? Where they, how are they gonna eat? How are they gonna live? How many hours do they have to work a week at $10 an hour to even pay rent and buy food? Maybe they'll steal it from their restaurant, I don't know, but we need to make sure, look, the minimum wage is not a novel idea. This has been around like child labor laws since the beginning of the 20th century. When, when are we gonna stop debating this? It should have been adjusted for inflation over the last 40 years. All right, um, I think, I just, I, just to clarify, um, I think I heard that you're not in favor of- I'm pretty sure I was pretty clear okay, about that, thank you. Um, you know, I would just say, that, you know, again, that it's, we, we have to make sure that we understand the unintended consequences of legislation. I've heard this perfect in lieu of the good uh, argument now several times. I'm a legislator, I make laws. I can't write a draft, throw it up in the air and hope that it's good enough. It's really important that we develop laws and understand the unintended consequences before we vote on them in All the right. chamber. Right. I take it seriously. You're gonna have to end you there because I just want to give you a chance to clarify. Um, okay, I think the uh, next question uh, is to Representative uh, Zebrin. Um, it's uh, a similar talk, we're hearing debate, another uh, social issue. Uh, should Connecticut mandate paid family leave? 
Uh, why or why not? Who pays for it? So in the last, in the last budget, uh, the last legislative session, uh, we talked about paid family medical leave. In order to start that program, it would have taken, I believe, about $20 million of an infusion in cash in order to set that up. It's not going to start immediately uh, with the contributors uh, making sure that that program is solvent. At this time, because of all the, the, the issues that we have around the state, Norm can call it what he wants, but when the business community says, we can't afford it, we're going to close and move somewhere else with so many new mandates, it's not just paid family medical leave. Now there's a mandatory retirement program, too, that people have to adjust for and get their payroll taxes adjusted for that. Enough is enough. I think we need to be slow, especially considering we haven't even gotten back the jobs that were lost in 2008. We're sluggish behind every New England state with our job growth and our, and our economic uh, vitality. And I'd like to see us make some additional progress there before we start with some of these kinds of programs. Uh, Mr. Nienelman, your position on the paid family leave proposal. So I think I heard not now. Um, I think properly crafted legislation here will be a good thing for the state on a net-net basis. I think that how we phase it in, who pays for it, how it's paid for to start it are questions for sure in a tight budget. But I think if our plan is to attract young people to the state, they are looking for this kind of a benefit. They know they're going to have to pay for it. And I want to attract young people to our state. We live in a world today where there are, in almost every family I know, two working partners, two working spouses that have to leave their kids, that have to do things that back when my parents were, were when I was being raised, they did not do that. We need to make it easy to be in the state for people who want to come here, have families, live here, prosper here, work for companies in Connecticut, I think that it should be like unemployment compensation largely paid for by the employee and employer, but I think it's an absolute plus and it's an absolute necessity going forward. Representative Zebrin, you got another 30 seconds on this question? Thank you. The reality of the legislature right now is any of these programs you've mentioned can be passed with the majority. Why wasn't it passed in the House and brought forward to the Senate? Our governor, our lieutenant governor, Nancy Wyman, certainly would have been able to break that tie. So this idea that somehow Democrats are so committed to this program, they've been in the majority in the legislature for 40 years, 40 years. The last time the Senate Republicans had a majority was 1991. If they want this program, call it for a vote, and let's see where it goes. Thank you. Uh, next question begins with Mr. Needleman. Uh, do you support installing electronic tolls on Connecticut highways uh, to pay for the state's transportation needs? Uh, if not, uh, how would you otherwise propose for paying for those uh, uh, demands? So, to me, tolls are a last resort. But again, I go back to the Commission on Fiscal Stability. They recommended them. Um, I believe that they're an inevitability. I think that we're going to find no other way to fund transportation without decimating school construction and other bonding projects that, for the most part, are deemed essential. Um, so the answer is, I think it's going to happen. I think that I would not want the DOT to unilaterally propose a plan for tolls. I would never support that. I think there's got to be a collaborative discussion. I think that the plan for 73 tolling gantry was, was a terrible idea, but it bothers me that people drive through Connecticut, don't buy gas here, and, and use our roads and burn down the highways and basically give us nothing in return. A lot of the traffic on 95 is through traffic, and we need to do what every other state in the Northeast has done, and that is make sure that we get our share of those dollars. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Zebrin, your thoughts on uh, You know, Paul, I just have to point out, you've pronounced my name five different ways I know, so I'm far. Sorry. I, I just apologize. want you to know, it's, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying I'm it, but proud. it's just so funny. Um, so, yeah. so Guilty for, as charged. 
And now shorter time. You can't counter time on <laughs> okay, uh, fine. pointing out. The uh, so I, you know, I'm definitely against tolls, as certainly as they've been um, presented by the Department of Transportation. 72 tolling locations, uh, no way. 30 to 40 percent are the, depending on which study you read, or where our out-of-state drivers are. It's not the majority of people. Our residents are the majority users of those highways, and it's another tax for them. I'm concerned. When it comes to the bipartisan budget, we were successful in the minority, including a provision called Prioritize Progress. And Prioritize Progress has actually stabilized the STF for the next five years, providing $1.5 billion of funding for our transportation system without tolls and taxes. How did we do that? We did that because there's two pots of bonding money through the Special Transportation Fund and then from something else with our general obligation bonds. We, the minority caucus, hopefully one day we'll be in the majority caucus, when we put these forward, these proposals, we instead say, core services and general obligation bonding, transportation should be prioritized. We do it, and we do it successfully, and it was implemented, the beginning of it, in the bipartisan budget. We also make sure we're fully funding school construction, clean water, and we put in additional money for crumbling foundations. Thank you. Mr. Needleman. I'm surprised I didn't hear the infamous splash pad. Um, prioritized progress comes that plan comes with a lot of other things that don't get done. Um, so we'd have great highways and we'd have schools with leaky roofs. Um, I find that not to be a good trade-off. Um, and I, I, I was going to actually correct him on your name at some point, because he did it to <laughs> You called me the wrong thing once or <laughs> twice, too. But we're going to let all that go, Paul. Um, so I, I think we differ on this. I think it's inevitable, and I think it's going to happen. So. You think someone named Charnier would have better appreciation? But I, I'm, I did write it down, but it didn't do me much good. Um, representative, there you go. <laughs> uh, what can be done, or what have you done in the legislature to keep retirees from leaving Connecticut and taking their incomes and lifetime savings with them? Yeah, you know. I I'm very proud of my campaign team and my volunteers. We have knocked on almost 16,000 doors now as of today, and we are talking to a lot of folks that have sale or sale pending signs on their homes, and it's heartbreaking. But we did make some incremental progress, again, in the bipartisan budget. We've started to phase out all of Social Security income for those making $100,000 as a couple or less. Pension uh, funding as well. We're starting to phase out the income tax there. And one of the things that sounds like it's, uh, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense, but it actually does, is the estate tax. We have a lot of people who just by having that tax, we're one of the only states in the country that have it, they see that and they see that as a ticket to get out of here. And in fact, I was just talking to Representative Vincent Candelora today, who's very uh, influential and active in the Finance Committee, and that work already has seen a $50 million increase in projected revenues by starting to deal with that estate tax and putting it at federal levels. We have started to make incremental progress. There's more to be done. And again, my door is open uh, to our seniors. It's heartbreaking, some of the stories I hear. The last thing is we definitely reinstated the Medicare savings program, unlike Medicaid savings program, unlike what I've been accused of, we fully reinstated that for our seniors. Thank you. And Mr. Nealman, again, the question was, uh, what might be done to keep more of our seniors uh, uh, to stay here in Connecticut? So um, two years ago, that budget actually cut 85,000 people off the Medicare savings plan. Um, thank God it was a mistake, I believe. Thank God they restored it. It would have affected half of the seniors, I think, that got it. Um, look, <clears throat> the estate tax is one of those things that certainly would impact me. Um, and I went, when I ran last time, and I, I spoke with the leadership in the Senate and said the state needs to minimally harmonize its estate tax laws with the federal government. We should not kick in at one threshold and the federal government kicks in at another. That will have to be changed now because there are people who pay a lot of taxes in the state that can leave and will leave. Um, but I'm not for eliminating the estate tax. I don't believe in passing wealth in an unlimited way from one generation to the next. I think it's wrong. Going to higher thresholds on pension and Social Security income, being tax exempt, and probably a more progressive um, income tax code that's revenue neutral. 
that gives people at the lower end of the spectrum some more breaks and a lower tax rate, and people like me, a slightly higher tax rate, as long as we don't look at it as a way to get more money, is something that we probably will need to do. Representative? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I I've talked a lot uh, previously about the way we do our budgeting. We talk about revenue. You should know that at the Capitol, we do it the exact opposite of the way that you do it in your own home. We have a separate spending committee or appropriations committee, and then we have a separate finance committee that deals with raising the, technically the revenue. We actually, at the state, set the spending first, and then they go and figure out how to raise the revenue to meet that spending level. I'm going to be insisting on a ways and means committee so that we finally live within our means in the state of Connecticut, and that confidence should help all of us. Thank you. Um, the next question begins with Mr. Needleman. Uh, do you support, well, we'll kind of preface that. I mean, we've seen the uh, legalized marijuana uh, movement spread here to New England, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Vermont, Maine, um, and the debate has begun here in Connecticut. Would you support the legalization of marijuana for use by adults 21 and older? So the answer to that is yes. Um, I think that the minute it goes on sale recreationally in Massachusetts, it's effectively legal in Connecticut. Um, so, you know, anybody in Connecticut at the furthest point is an hour and a half away from Massachusetts. Um, but I think we need to be respectful and make sure that it's regulated properly. We need to make sure that kids can't get it. We need to make sure that we enhance our prevention programs to make sure that um, you know, we, we have a massive opioid problem and it's very hard to talk to somebody who has suffered from that crisis in any way um, that pot is not a gateway drug. I don't believe it is. I don't believe the data suggests it is, but I believe that there are people who do think it that have lost relatives and we need to be careful. I also think we need to find better ways to make sure that um, that we can determine impairment when somebody is driving. Because as the chief of police in Essex, I deal with our police and it is a concern for them. Thank you. Um. Representative? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, this is an area, Norm and I have uh, appeared now at forums and debates for a while. This is probably one of the few areas where we actually are in agreement. Um, you know, I. Uh, have never been afraid to stand up on principled issues. This was one of those issues that I've been very opposite of the uh, majority of my caucus. I'm the only Republican who's put forward a bill to legalize marijuana for those 21 and older. And I did so working across the aisle in a very collaborative and intense way. Representative Robin Porter from New Haven and Representative Tony Walker from New Haven and I sat down two and a half, maybe more than that, years ago to develop uh, the uh, legalization proposal in a bipartisan way. And then we took it a step further and I drafted the testimony for all of us and we split it up into thirds. And for the first time in the front of the Department of Public, in front of the Public Health Committee, the three of us sitting behind that podium gave that testimony together. And so these are opportunities where I will look to find ways to collaborate with those who I might not agree with and other issues. Representative Porter's the chair of the Labor Committee. Clearly, I don't agree with some of those things. Representative Walker is the chair of the Appropriations Committee. Clear, I don't agree with all of her issues. But when I can find opportunities to work with my friends across the aisle, I will, and that won't stop in the Senate. Um, you have another 30 seconds to respond to what you've heard if you choose. I'll set on that question. Uh, Representative Zebrin. I don't know. I'm <laughs> just, trying. Just give up. Could be, um, it could be Melissa and Norm. Uh, is, is the state doing enough to address the opioid crisis uh, in our communities? Yeah, this is a, you know, such a heavy issue uh, for all of us, regardless of party. Um, I remember when my... Um, my son's friend was found dead in East Haddam after he had overdosed. It affects every single community, regardless of color, regardless of how much money you make. It's a scourge. We have done a lot. We've increased our prescription monitoring program. Veterinarians now have to report on that program because unfortunately, 
opiates literally changed the brain chemistry, and we had significant cases of people with their pets that would fake an illness or an injury so that they could get that medication. It's just heartbreaking. Two weeks ago, I was in Norwich for a uh, mental health and substance abuse forum, and one of the questions from the audience members was this. Do you think that the work on opioid addiction has sucked the oxygen out of the room so you no longer are paying attention to mental health issues? And that question kind of had me stop right in my tracks. Because, you know, I think that there are some folks out there who see the huge response, coordinated response, bipartisan response to opioid addiction, and they wonder what about some of the other issues that are maybe as equally important to some other folks than others. I think the state has done a lot. Uh, through President Trump, we were given a lot of money to ad ad additionally uh, deal with some of those issues at the federal level. One of the commissioners of DEMAS is uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Rittman, and she's doing a good job at coordinating those efforts as well. Okay, uh, Mr. Needleman. So, um, I, I was on the board of a drug and alcohol treatment facility for quite a while in, um, in Middletown and Meriden, um, and I have a pretty good understanding of the problem, and I would argue that you can almost never do enough. Um, we have a problem that, besides behavioral, um, we've, we've managed to regulate the doctors, and a lot of them don't particularly like it because most doctors don't over-prescribe. A handful did, and now there's this massive regulation that any time you, you know, get pain medicine for anything, it gets reported to a central system, and they watch doctors. It's almost like they've criminalized doctors. The problem is law enforcement, um, and it's core to who some people are. Addiction, alcoholism, gambling problems are, are ingrained in a lot of people. And, um, and I think that ultimately we're going to need to spend more money on it. We can't squeeze out, and Melissa and I agree on this, you cannot squeeze out other mental health issues. Um, I, I, I think we both went up to gateway counseling and there are people there that have other problems that need those programs. The state has participated. They privatized and still participated. They've frozen funding. They want to tax some of these facilities. Some of these things are just not right. Um, so we need to de do everything we can with the opioid crisis, but we can't forget about the other mental health issues. Thank you. I get another 30 seconds. If you Thank like you. Um, so a few weeks before that crisis hit our uh, community in East Haddam, I had held the first opioid forum in East Hampton because they had dealt with some deaths uh, earlier in that year. And in doing so, I've really uh, been connected and spend a lot of time with parents of those who are addicted and addicts themselves. And one of the things I'm very concerned about are locations of our methadone treatment. What I hear a lot is that when they're going for their methadone treatment, they're walking the line and being uh, introduced again into that community because drug dealers are sitting there waiting for them. We need to look at other things like Vivitrol, which is an exact shot. Um, there's other medication assistance that I think we need to do a better job looking at. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for one more question. It, uh, begins with the first selectman. Um, the current uh, administration in Washington and the, and the Congress uh, is obviously not friendly to the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, an effort to repeal it uh, failed, but uh, clearly the policies show that uh, it's not uh, popular with the administration. Do you see a role for Connecticut uh, in that regard uh, to continue uh, to assure uh, access to health care for the citizens in this state? I think it's a moral issue when we have to find a way. Um, I'm, a, I'm appalled at what's going on in Washington. We're trying to walk, roll back some of the protections of the Affordable Care Act, um, like lifetime cap elimination and like um, uh, pre-existing conditions. We, we have friends in our family that are younger and they're going to opt, they're going to age out of Husky um, and we don't know what they're going to do. These are people of all different ages um, that could be left out, of the cold, out in the cold with no health insurance. 
We all know that the Affordable Care Act was not perfect, but it was an attempt to do something to make sure that people had a baseline of insurance. And I think that it's a disaster what's going on. Unfortunately, it's expensive. And the way health insurance works is you have to defray it over the largest pool possible. Um, doing it in one state uh, is probably going to be difficult, but I hope that we can collaborate with other states around us and find a way to make a larger pool so we keep some of those protections because they're going to kill it. Thank you. Representative. Thank you. So I'm very proud of my work, again, in a bipartisan way. I worked with other legislators on something that was commonly referred to as the 10 essential health benefits for women. And it was a proposal that, in case Obamacare was repealed, that the 10 essential health benefits for women would still be preserved in the state of Connecticut. And I was one of a handful of Republican legislators that worked across the aisle to make sure I was supporting that bill. One of the provisions, for instance, was access to birth control for a year and other things. So I think that we have made some small steps, regardless of what happens in Washington, D.C. and Connecticut, so that we can protect those 10 essential health benefits. Um, I think that another place that we need to spend a little bit more time is certainly with an access health and the new Office of Health strategy. I wasn't really a big fan of yet more bureaucracy and another office and more admin, and I'd like to do a little bit more digging to find out exactly how effective they're going to be. Thank you. And you get the last word on this one. Yeah, so um, I went into a business up in Portland a few weeks ago, and that business, as we were walking out, it was a, um, a breakfast restaurant. The woman who owned it said to me, please make sure that Access Connecticut stays intact. It's the reason that I'm in business, and it's the reason my employees can work for me. This is a critical issue, not only morally, but it's a critical issue in terms of economic development. Having this kind of insurance that is not the best, but at least it's something, gives people the ability to start businesses, open, open businesses, and, and work in places that can't afford insurance. Thank you. Um, uh, so we're going to go to our closing statements. Each candidate gets one minute to uh, provide a closing statement. I want to thank the audience. It's been very uh, respectful uh, throughout this debate. And uh, we begin with the state representative. <laughs> Thank you. So again, the single greatest issue for Connecticut is our fiscal crisis. Our state is sick. We need to deliver tough medicine. The solutions won't be easy, but I'm ready to continue to work with other problem solvers, no matter their party affiliation. This is my fourth election for state office and by far the most negative I have experienced. Not a day goes by without a friend or neighbor sharing another misleading flyer or unflattering picture produced by my opponent. Despite this, I remain focused on my dedication to public service, talking with tens of thousands of voters about my hope for Connecticut and listening to their ideas. Unlike my opponent, if elected, I can walk into the Capitol on day one and put my detailed knowledge of the state budget to work. I will work to address the flawed budget process, working to finalize the state budget long before session adjourns. Finally, I will always treat your tax dollars, because there's no such thing as state money, carefully while giving the job 100% of my attention rather than some of my free time. I'm at your service. Thank you. Mr. Needleman. So thank you, Paul, for hosting this, regardless of how you did our names. Um, <laughs> you massacred us. I'm sorry. <laughs> Connecticut needs a fresh start. We need out-of-the-box thinking, municipal and government, municipal and economic development expertise, budget discipline, and most of all, cooperation. We need ideas that will help us produce jobs. My opponent plays the blame game. She pretends to be bipartisan and then tells you she can only be effective if her side wins. The last thing our district needs is another politician who is ingrained in a fail part failed partisan system. I am not beholden to a political party or to a special interest groups or their dark money. I won't go to Hartford with a political agenda, but to find people who are willing to work together to get the state moving in the right direction. Party labels are irrelevant to me. What really matters is a genuine willingness to find solutions. Working side by side with Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, I have lowered taxes, 
created jobs, streamline, streamline government and balance budgets. Please wrap up. Those are the skills I will bring to Hartford. Thank you. And we could applaud our candidates. I think they did a great job.